Oh, good evening, morning, afternoon, night, whatever it is. How are you? Here we are. Keys to the Kingdom, book three, Drowned Wednesday, all written by the amazing Garth Nix. So, we kind of, it happened, didn't it? Arthur defeated, oh, I've got hiccups. Arthur defeated Feverfew, and um, we're now off to get away. So, surely that's ended? But no, look, we've still got a few chapters to go. So what needs to happen? We need to get the will. Uh, sorry, we need to get the key. We need to amalgamate the key, the will parts, etc. We need to get Arthur and Leaf home. That's what still needs to happen. So are you ready? We'll pick it up where we left it off last night. Why won't it help to get out of the room? Arthur asked the cup. We have to. This room is still where it was, in the old port Wednesday, underwater. I don't know how far. Besides, I can find no way from here to the outside of the room. Because there isn't one, or because of some... Oh, sorry. Because there isn't one, or because of something else? Asked Arthur. There may be an exit. But this room is strangely twisted, and I simply have not had time to work out its exact place within the fabric of the house, you know. I doubt anybody could save the architect herself. The Atlas, cried Arthur. He reached down into his boot and pulled out the green book. Can you use the complete atlas of the house? No, said the cup. As it spoke, there was a commotion near the door to the moth. Arthur jumped up onto Caterpillar's blanket box to see over the heads of the denizens. Sunscorch, who had been handling the last few stragglers, was just inside the door. A piece of the sky has fallen in, he roared over the hubbub, and the sea is starting to turn like water going down a plug hole. There has to be a way out, said Arthur. He held the atlas and focused all of his attention on it. Arthur, said the cup, not now hissed Arthur. His knuckles were stark and white against the green book. He was gripping it so hard. I'm concentrating. Arthur. Arthur ignored the cup. Is he going to tell him to have faith? Arthur ignored the cup and concentrated on his question. Where is the way out of this room back into the house? The atlas stubbornly failed to open. Without a key, it just would not respond. Arthur, said the cup so loud that Arthur's ears rang. I cannot use the atlas, you know, but I can help you use it. Place your right hand against the glass of my jar. Jebenezer held up the jar and Arthur slapped his palm against the glass. The carp came right up against it, puckered up and kissed the side of the jar against Arthur's fingers three times. Each time it did, it shone more brightly, some of the light travelling through to bathe Arthur's fingers. Ask your question, Arthur. Arthur took his hand away and gripped the atlas again, repeating his question, willing the book to open with a determination that shut out everything else around him. Nothing happened for three seconds, just long enough for the carp to say, eh, we must have. Then the atlas exploded open. Arthur fell off the blanket box but was so hemmed in by Jebenezer, Susie, Leaf and the other denizens that his feet didn't even touch the floor. Arthur didn't notice. He was watching the perfect, though rapid, penmanship of the invisible writer in the atlas. Words spread across the page, Arthur shrieking them aloud as he read. The chief clerk's office of the Blue Moon Company's second counting house has been twisted seven turns sideways and inclined 12 degrees to the impossible due to incompetent renovation. There are three means of egress from within the office. One is to the ship Moth through the former front door. The second opens on the void of nothing and has been sealed under the floor ten paces to the left of the front door. The third opens in the ship telegraph turret of the Blue Moon Company in Old Port Wednesday and is located through the mirrored back of the former record safe now in use as a wardrobe. No! yelled Ichabod, but his voice was drowned out by the surge of denizens toward the wardrobe. Hold, followers! Link arms. Moth, stand still, roared Sunscorch. Manasses, hold your ground, shouted Panikin, and may be activated by peeling off the wallpaper backing, 
finished Arthur. He slapped the atlas shut, jumped down and wormed his way between the denizens to the wardrobe. It was a huge oak panelled affair, easily 10 feet high and 15 feet wide. Ichabod, is there any trick in to going in? Is there any trick to going in? No, sir, said Ichabod stiffly. He had managed to appear at Arthur's elbow, unruffled and calm once more. Simply walk through, but if I may remove the captain's clothes before they are trampled. He was interrupted by a very loud cracking sound and the floor shivered underneath Arthur's feet. He didn't wait to hear any more from Ichabod, but strayed straight at the mirror. The inside of the wardrobe was bigger than the outside, and there were racks of clothes against the side walls and shelves of boots, shoes and accessories. The rear wall was wallpapered with a simple blue flower pattern and had a chaise long against it, next to the small table with an open book of fashion plates on it. Arthur hurried over, shoved the table and book aside and pulled the chaise long away from the wall. Then he reached up and pulled a loose corner of wallpaper. It came away easily, revealing a mirrored surface underneath. Arthur ripped some more and then Susie and Leaf and Jebenezer and even Ichabod were there pulling at the paper as well. What if it's really deep on the other side? Will we get the bends going up? asked Leaf. Can he get the bends in the house? I don't know, snapped Arthur. We haven't got a choice, have we? Get through as soon as the paper's off. What about you? asked Susie. I've just got to make sure everybody gets out. You guys go or you'll get trampled, all right? As the paper was almost off, he took the carp's jar from Jebenezer and stepped back out of the wardrobe, hitting a solid wall of waiting denizens, who were barely kept in check by the combined efforts of the mates, some of the carp's followers, and the more dependable crew. Arthur managed to squeeze three back to the blanket box. He stepped up on that, ignoring the fact that it was vibrating along with the floor like a badly tuned car. OK, carp, maximum volume. Repeat what I say. Hmm. I'll do so, said the sh said the carp at the sharp. Quiet down, quiet down. Don't push and wait your turn. Don't push, wait your turn. Everyone will get out. Everyone will get out. Listen carefully, but don't move till I tell you. Listen carefully, but don't move till I tell you. There are two walls of mirrors to go through. There are two walls of mirrors to go through. Walk slowly and carefully through the wardrobe mirrors and keep going through the next set of mirrors. You'll come out underwater. Swim up and try to help anyone who needs it. Walk slowly and carefully through the wardrobe mirrors and keep going through the next set of mirrors. You will come out underwater. Swim up and try and help anyone who needs it. Everyone at the back stay still. If you're in front of the wardrobe, start walking slowly forward. Everyone at the back stay still. If you're in the front of the wardrobe, start walking slowly forward. As space opens in front of you, walk slowly forward. Steady. Everyone will get through. As space opens in front of you, walk slowly forward. Steady. Everyone will get through. Arthur kept giving instructions as the denizens shuffled forward into the mirrored doors of the wardrobe. Every now and then one would panic and Arthur would stop breathing as it looked like the fear could spread, only for everything to come back under control as calmer denizens wrestled the panicked one back into line. This is all taking too long, Arthur thought as he was forced to step down from the blanket box which was shaking itself to pieces. The floor under his feet was starting to glow a nasty dull red. If it wasn't for his immaterial boots, Arthur was sure he would feel the heat. Let's move a bit faster, he called out. The carp repeated his words. Perhaps half the denizens had gone three, so there was more room and less likelihood of terrible crush. Five minutes later, the walls started to weep black, tar-like tears the size of Arthur's head, and the floor was twisting and tilting as much as by six inches up and down. <gasps> Come on! Faster now! yelled Arthur, jogging on, oh, jogging on the spot and then forward when the space opens. He demonstrated jogging as best as he could with his crab-armoured leg on a moving surface. Perhaps 200 denizens remained, but the room was clearly under enormous stress, and that meant that the moth and the world let outside must be close to final destruction. Can you tell what's happening outside? whispered Arthur to the carp as he moved to the back, smiling and waving on jogging denizens. I mean, the moth side, Feverfew's world lit. It's still there because we're still here, said the cup. Hold on a moment and I'll check. It whizzed around its jar several times and then stopped. Mm, the underlying structure is holding, though the cosmetic features like the hills and so forth have all gone. 
Remarkable, really. Grim Tuesday lacked true feel, lacked true flair, but his work was always very solid. How long have we got? Minutes, not hours. I can't say closer than that, really. Right, said Arthur grimly. There was some sort of hold up near the rear ranks of denizens. He threaded his way over to it to find Sun Scorch panicking and Captain Swell trying to pry Captain Caterpillar from a display cabinet. Arthur was only mildly surprised not to see Concord, who must have already fled through the wardrobe. I can't go without at least the heart of my collection, sobbed Caterpillar. Just one cabinet. You can help me carry it. If it can't go, I won't go. Lord Arthur, Please tell the captain he has to leave his stamps behind, said Sunscorch. You do have to leave them, said Arthur. Look around. This place isn't going to last much longer. We have to hurry everyone through, and you need to set an example. No, said Caterpillar mullishly. He hugged the cabinet. If my collection is to be destroyed, well then I shall go with it. I guess let him stay then said Arthur. He glanced over the remaining denizens. There were perhaps fifty left, all gathered near the wardrobe, which was becoming harder to get into as the floor bucked up and down. Everyone else, let's get through the mirrors. The boy turned and joined the back of the relatively orderly queue that was steadily streaming into the wardrobe. He was glad to be able to grab hold of denizens around him because he would have fallen over otherwise. The floor was so unstable. The ceiling's slanting down, isn't it? Arthur asked as they got down to the last 20 denizens. From that corner, really quickly. In the far left corner, the distance from the floor to the ceiling had been cut in half and the ceiling was still steadily moving down like some kind of industrial crusher. It hit some of the display stands which resisted the downward pressure for a moment, then buckled in a spray of glass and metal. Caterpillar, this is it. Come now or you'll die shouted Arthur as he edged closer to the wardrobe. There were only a dozen denizens in front of him now, and Su Susie and Leaf, Arthur's head snapped around, Caterpillar forgotten for a second. I told you both to go through. We might not make it now. The floor broke in half as he spoke, a crevasse opening in the middle of the room. Yellow mud boiled up out of it, preceded by clouds of stinking gas. Caterpillar was on the wrong side, still clutching his display case. Arthur held his breath and grabbed Leaf and Susie, or they grabbed him, and the three of them jumped through the wardrobe mirrors, only just making it as the crevasse split the floor even further, toppling the wardrobe over. Inside, the wardrobe was a tangled mess of trampled clothes and broken furniture. But even worse, it had toppled forward so that the mirrored back wall was now the ceiling, Twelve feet above the three children and impossibly out of reach. Stand on my soldier Stand on my shoulders, Arthur started to say, but he hadn't seen Sunscorch who had wedged himself in a corner. Without wasting a word, the second mate picked up Leaf and threw her straight up and through the mirror gate. As he turned to pick up Susie, she jumped, got one foot on his shoulder, and leaped up without assistance. Arthur stumbled, his crab armoured leg caught in discarded coats. Go! he shouted to Sunscorch as he desperately tried to untangle himself and only made it worse. Just go! Oh my gosh. You hero, Arthur, you hero. Whoa. How's he going to get up, though, if he sends Sunscorch? How's he going to get up? Some sort of heir to the kingdom super jump? Or maybe, do you reckon that, um, what's his face? Caterpillar will come in and put his stamp collection on the floor for him to stand on. No, Caterpillar's gone. Caterpillar has gone, everybody! Gosh. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing you back here tomorrow night for some more of the story. We are so close to the end now. I can smell it. Okay. Bye. Pardon me. <laughs> Unless you're here for some waffle. Uh, Ringo, oh my goodness, Ringo, Ringo, Ringo. Last night, my one job was to keep... Oh, God, itchy nose. <laughs> my one job was to keep him in the house. I let the dog out for a wee before I came to bed. Ringo went outside. <laughs> I could not get him back in, so Ringo stayed outside. I've never had such a sleepless night. Oh, my goodness. I was, I was kind of worrying about something about work as well, so I was like, <laughs> work. 
Coo, Ringo, coo, work all night. <laughs> Rubbish. But um, yeah, I gave in in the end and just got up and let Ringo or went out to find Ringo in my PJs and my Crocs. <laughs> Other shoes are available. Um, yeah, I found him and he came in. But then he, he seemed all right. Like I say, he has to go up high to get some food, so zero, the dog can't eat it. Uh, but he just can't get up there anymore. So he, he eventually, like I thought, I'm going to watch to see what he can do. And he did get up slowly to his food, but then he just slept again under Blake's bed all day. And then, um, yeah, went out to do whatever he needed to do. And then he's back again. He did come and sit on my lap earlier on, and he never does that. Last time he sat on my lap was when I showed you him when I was reading Diana Wynne-Jones. That was a long time ago. But, um, yeah, he did come and have a little sleep on my lap when I got home from work with and had him a coffee. But, yeah, he's gone to sleep under Blake's bed again now. So, poor old Bean. Uh, what else has happened? Spoke to Blake yesterday. He FaceTimed at 10pm. What, oh, Blake? Chill out, mate. My bedtime. <laughs> but um, I think he was just getting a little bit worried about Ringo as well. It is his best buddy, apart from Zero. Both of the pets Blake's best buddies. He loves animals. But um, yeah, Blake was telling me that he went to the wrong lecture yesterday. Good work there, sir. So uh, yeah, it was nice to hear from him. And uh, tonight he's very excited because there's a club that they do, a student club every Wednesday. And tonight it's Star Wars themed. And as you probably may well already know, Blake and myself are very big into the old Star Wars. So yeah, so he's excited to go and do that tonight. Uh, Phoebe, I think she's going to be going to bed in a minute. What is it for me when I'm recording this is ten past seven. I think Phoebe will be going to bed in a minute. She is cream crackered, as the saying goes. But we've got one and a half more weeks left until she can have a week off. Woo! <laughs> I, she, I don't think she is quite ready for this. I told her you get tired, and she's like, I'll be right. I'm young, I'm young. <laughs> That's not how she's talk how she talks. But um yeah, I don't think she was quite ready for that. Uh Floyd, when I got home from work, was outside in the pouring rain on his scooter. Great work there, Floyd. And Bo he made a bolognese at school today and he had that for his tea. So there you go. Here's a little catch up. <laughs> I haven't got anything dramatic apart from cat watch to say um to let you know about but yeah nothing else dramatic has happened today which is quite good i'm glad about that i could do with a day or two with no drama please universe all right okay i look forward to seeing you all back here tomorrow Ow, leave me a little comment i love it i know jenny has been leaving comments here with capital letters no less jenny i know that goblin wizard has been leaving me comments here so yeah leave me a, just say hi let me know what you think of the story. Are you looking forward to our next story? Which is Neil Gaiman. Uh, something the milk. Presumably the milk. Fortunately the milk. That's the next one that we're going to read. Neil Gaiman. Fortunately the milk. That's our next book. Because we're so close to ending this one now. And then remember after Neil Gaiman. The one that I know everybody is waiting for. The final Tiffany book. Mm. all right okay i'll see you soon <laughs>